Good evening, guys. It is Bible Scribe. I'm glad to see you back again. Thank you for joining me. Universalism and atheism, strange bedfellows. So we're going to talk a little bit tonight about universalism specifically. Uh, I'm not going to go into super detail on the topic, but uh, I'm going to hit some high points and make some comparisons that I think will be striking. Uh, you know, I, having taken a partial preterist position on eschatology, I have obviously discussed many things with full preterists and partial preterists alike. Um, I have a lot in common with full preterists uh, and a lot in common with the partials. I'm actually somewhere in the middle, but that aside, one of the things I have seen in many of the full preterist people that I have spoken to is the idea of universalism. Universalism being the idea that that eternal torment or punishment in hell is not appropriate for God and that that is not a tool he will use in dealing with humans after they die. The idea essentially that all humans will go to heaven in the end, and somehow in some way, that that will occur and that no one will be sent to hell or the lake of fire for torment or punishment. So uh, I wanted to bring these points out. We're going to bring up some slides and talk a little bit about this. So I tried to find online some of the arguments of universalism. I'm not going to go into detail on the like scripture references or anything like that. This is just to get an idea. Some of these points here of universalism is that the nature of God is love. So, you know, a universalist would say that because God's love, he would never send anyone to hell. He wouldn't do something that's that mean and vindictive. Then the second point, the nature of man, that he's instinctively, like man has an instinctive love of good things over bad things. Even though, you know, these people would say, even though men know that bad things are bad and do them, that in the end they really want just happiness and love and and good things. The next point being that universalists would say uh, that the flesh at some point, obviously when we die or whether there's anything in the future for for humans as far as a cataclysm or anything like that, we will die and lose our flesh. The flesh will be destroyed. So that is the source of sin, say many universalists. And because that the flesh brings with it the desires, um, the lusts, all those things, that once that is done away with, then the spirit will not be bound by sin anymore. And so it doesn't make sense for the spirit to then be punished in eternal torment in hell or anywhere else. The next point, the nature of sin, again, relates to what we just said, but that sin is the act of a finite being, a, a a flesh and blood human, not the act of a spirit, which is funny because angels fall and have sinned many times throughout history and tons of writings, but we won't go into that right now. The next point, that holiness and happiness are connected qualities of God and are everlasting. Uh, I, I got these from a website. I'm not sure I can explain that. Um, you know, I suppose God is happy. Uh, it doesn't say that in scripture. So, <laughs> but the this point being that I suppose because they see God as a happy, holy person being, that He would not do something that is um, it punishment, is torment, all those things. The next point here that they would say punishment signifies a correction and a reform, and to make someone better, not to destroy someone. So the idea that God would send humans after death to a place of destruction or eternal torment or anything final is anathema to the universalists because they would say punishment or correction is, is what God does, but that's not eternal. It's something to bring about the reform of the individual. Then the last point uh, I put on here is the teachings of the Bible are positive teachings for the good of mankind, for the good of people, uh, and that has to do with the promises in the Bible. They, you know, make arguments about the promises being 
um, unconditional, uh, whereas the other side of the argument would be that they were conditional. And for instance, the Israelites lost access to God's grace and good, uh, you know, blessings because of their disobedience. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure how they make that argument, but uh, there you go. So these are the points, kind of the arguments of universalism. I'm not going into detail for a reason, and that is we're going to compare this and see what commonalities it has with atheism. And so if we look at that, I, you know, I just wanted to bring this out because I'm not sure many universalists uh, realize this, but they have these things in perfect sync and harmony with atheism which is, of course, the belief that God does not exist and never existed. Point number one here, that you will not be held accountable for your actions. Atheists don't believe you'll be held accountable for your actions because, as far as, you know, eternally or after life because they don't believe there is any, right? So they have that perfectly in common with universalism, that you will not be held accountable for your actions, at least not permanently. Point number two, nobody's going to go to hell. And atheists would say that's, that's absolutely true because atheists, again, don't believe in God, don't believe in hell. So in effect, the belief of the universalist is exactly the same. There's no hell. Either, either universalists will say there's no hell or that nobody's going to end up there, that maybe that's just a place for angels or something else, some other argument. But because you take that position, it's the exact same position as atheists. Number three there, uh, Satan is not a real thing you should worry about. And of course, uh, atheists would say that because they don't believe in God. They don't believe in Satan, generally speaking. Although it's uh, funny, I think uh, some atheists do believe in Satan. <laughs> but uh, universalists would have this in, in common with an atheist because they don't believe in most cases that Satan is a real person or a real entity either right along with hell. Point number four, everybody is okay. No matter what you are or have done or are doing in your life, you're going to be okay. And this is the motto of atheism. And it is now the motto of universalists. Everything you do, you're going to be okay, even though you may be a mass murderer. Uh, apparently, in the end, you don't have to worry about hell or eternal punishment for that wrongdoing. Uh, or that um, hatred of God, even if you go through this whole life absolutely hating God and everything about him, apparently to a universalist, you're going to be okay. And an atheist would say that exact thing, saying that uh, because there's no God, there's no, the Bible's not true, nothing in it is true, nothing ever was true about God or anything like that, that everybody is going to be okay as far as if they live their life to their own satisfaction. And number five, the whole Bible is more or less irrelevant to us. Now, most universalists would see this point, and they would say, no, I don't believe that at all. But the fact is that if in the end there is no recompense for evil or wickedness, then there's no reason for us to pay attention to the Bible any longer. We can live our life the way we want to and not pay any attention to God because in the end, he's going to save us all, right? That's universalism. And an atheist would say the exact same thing. The Bible is irrelevant to us because they don't believe it's true at all. They don't believe God is true or anything. So again, the position of the universalist in this case, exactly the same as the atheist position. Now, I... Uh, wanted to at least bring some general points about uh, about agreement with universalism or not uh, and some questions about this. So here's some gentle reminders to think about when we think about this. If you're a universalist, you know, think about these things. And you may not agree with this first point for sure, but the Bible just doesn't agree with universalism. Um, Christ doesn't preach it. Uh, the You'd think if it was a real doctrine that, that you know, each of the New Testament writers would have taken some time out to talk about that even though you are wicked, you know, in the end it's going to be okay, so don't stress too much 
don't stress yourselves about trying to do right righteous things or being righteous is that what they said no all of the new testament writers said stay away from these things fornication wickedness idolatry all these things okay stay away from them it's important that you don't do evil and that you serve god and uh so i would say the bible does not agree with universalism of course a universalist would argue with that the next point here though why were there martyrs who died preaching repentance and righteousness if 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 there was if it was universally true that all people will end up in heaven why did people go to their deaths throughout history not just at the time of christ and shortly thereafter but throughout the centuries we've had even in the present day we have martyrs dying for the gospel trying to bring people out of darkness out of wickedness into an ex a knowledge and acceptance of God and Christ Jesus and and uh, repentance and turning away from wickedness why would they care enough to preach it to their deaths well the fact is they all believed that it was important to turn away from wickedness and turn to God and reconcile yourself to God lest you be punished lest you be destroyed in the end. That was the whole point of all the martyrs. Why, this next point, did Jesus save us if there's nothing to save us from? Universalism is saying, you know, in the end, it doesn't matter what we've done. We're all going to be saved. Well, why did Jesus have to go through all that if there's nothing to save us from? And I mean, I, I guess your argument would be, well, he saved everybody, the wicked and the good, when he when he died on the cross. But, uh, you know, it's a lot of trouble. You'd think if God was going to save everyone from the beginning, he would have just done it. There there wouldn't be like a there's the sacrifice for for those who repented wouldn't have been as important, right? Something to think about. Next point. What about all the judgment passages throughout the Bible and other sacred writings? And we're not just talking about the Bible, but it, all the the relative or uh, related sacred writings. But just taking the Bible, I mean, there's tons of judgment passages where people were judged, and it was final. God judged nations. He judged the Jews in AD 70. <laughs> He, I mean, those were very final. And, and examples, I think, of what will await those who are wicked and never turn and reconcile to God in the afterlife. Um, but you have to, as a universalist, wrestle with why would God pass any judgment if everything is okay in the end? Then the last point here, why do you simply want to reject the parts of God's character? That you don't like. So the universalist will latch on to the verse that says, I believe it's in, uh, well, I can't remember if it's 1 John or something like that, but where it says God is love. Be, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And uh, they'll latch on to that one character trait of God and say that's, that's how we explain God, love. So that means every time I think of God, I can only think of love and every way he would act would only be in love. Although we have a historical record through the Bible, if you know you've read through it and you understand the stories that were in the Old Testament, and that he is he has love, but but that has to be that has to be returned to him. Uh, it's not just a you know a, a blind love that uh, if you spit in his face that he will continue to pour out love in you. Oh, yeah, you hate me. Okay, I love you. I hate, You hate me, I love you more. That's not how God acts. There's always, you know, correction, reproof, and then judgment when that change doesn't happen in the individual or the group of individuals. Take, for instance, again, the nation of Israel. There were, along the way, corrections, chances to come back, but in the end there was harsh judgment and final judgment. That is the pattern. That is the nature of God. He gave love to them, and it was, it was a perfect love. 
but because it was rejected again and again, God's not going to just smack his face against the wall until you come around. He gives you ample opportunity, but at some point, it is what it is. And if you hate him, despise him, if you're wicked, that will be judged. So uh, a few more little points. Just, you know, if you read through the early church fathers, which I have, I've read a lot of the early church fathers, and I'm talking about the first few centuries after Christ, including people like Polycarp and Papias, who sat in the study under the apostles and, and spoke with them and learned under them. So we're talking as close to Christ as you can get. You'd think they would know, right? Well, they didn't agree with universalism. They preached against it. They preached the fires of hell. I have, uh, in other videos I've done, gotten quotes from Polycarp that say, he, you will be judged in the fire of hell, the lake of fire. He even says it. Um, so it's very obvious that the church fathers don't agree with universalism. Then, of course, you know, you have other ancient writings, and I, I mean Jewish writings that, you know, the pseudepigrapha, the apocrypha, I haven't seen in any of those any talk of everybody being okay in the end. There's always this sense of if you are a follower of God and, and righteous and you try and work towards that and towards his kingdom, then there's one destination for you. And if you fight him and despise him and do wickedness and self-service your whole life, then there's another place for you. And that's throughout all these ancient Jewish writings. And uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls right along with that. My, my third point there, they do not agree with universalism. If you read the writings of the Essenes, that were they were in scrolls right along with the Bible in the Qumran caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, they valued piety and righteousness and holiness over everything. And they they severely punished people and threw them out of their group if they were not able to stay pure and holy and righteous. So, uh, you know, they would not have in any way agreed with universalism. They had writings about, you know, God's judgment and final wars and es eschatological cataclysms and things like that, but it was all included God's judgment for wickedness. So, you know, I suppose this last question, who and what agrees with universalism? If you're a universalist, uh, you have to sit here and you have to ask yourself this question. And you know what the answer is to that question? I hate to say it's atheism. If you align yourself with universalist doctrine, you have also aligned yourself with some of the main points of atheists. And so I caution you, if you're a Christian and you have taken the doctrine of universalism, realize this. You now have eschatological and afterlife beliefs that are in perfect alignment with atheist belief. I think you should take caution at that. You should maybe reconsider some things. So please, take it to heart. Think about these things Go back to the scriptures and see what God did, perhaps with the, the nation of Israel. Uh, he tried so many times, and that was the love, so many times to gather them back, to gather them back. And then in the New Testament, Christ says, Oh, Israel, I would that I could have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not have it. And so he had to bring that final judgment and destruction of Jerusalem <laughs> in AD 70. It was horrific and final. And the wicked, as part of that prophecy and revelation, were sent to eternal torment. The wicked Jews. So I caution you, Christian, if you have taken the universalist approach to your beliefs and your doctrine. And that's it for the video. I, I thank you for joining me. Uh, you know, these are serious topics. I'm trying to get to really serious topics that really touch people where they're at. So if you enjoyed it, if you hated it, uh, let me know in the comments. Give me some uh, information and like and subscribe if you got something out of it. Thanks. Bye.